you have decided to spend this weekend with us. If you would go ahead and stand up with us. We're gonna do a song that we did last week called Alive In Me. It's a song that talks about God being in us and all the promises that He has for those of us who give our lives to Him. So we're gonna celebrate with that this morning together. My past is erased because of the cross. Hope writes my future because of your love. You have restored me for your glory, Lord. Now I have the victory because you've
sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan But you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Your love is the air that I'm breathing I am a future This morning, we want to welcome all of you that are watching online as well. And why don't all of you just go ahead and put a big smile on your face, greet the people around you, shake their hands, say good morning, and keep on standing and singing with us. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name This we know This we know You promise never to forsake What you began you will sustain This we know This we know Announce the fullness of your work This we know This we know And every enemy will flee As we declare your victory This we know Freedom is ours when we call 
For he alone is strong enough to say, Rise, your shackles are no more. For Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I will call upon the Lord. For he alone is strong enough. We're so excited this weekend to celebrate baby dedication. And these are some of the newest members of our church family. And I know you are excited as I am to welcome these beautiful little ones to this stage. Would you give them a hand this morning? <laughs> dedication is a significant part of their journey because it is an indication of where their parents' hearts are, that their parents are full of gratitude for the life that God has given them. And, and truly, God has blessed them with these lives. The Bible says children are a heritage of the Lord. They're literally His property. God just trusts us as parents and grandparents uh, with the lives of these little ones. And it is our challenge and our honor to raise them up in the nurture, in the admonition of the Lord. Pastor Scott and his team do a marvelous job of coming alongside these young families and just trying to support them, to love them and pray for them. And as a church, we're so honored to have them as a part of our church family and to welcome their family and friends who are here today to celebrate with them. So would you join me as we ask God to bless these little lives and bless these families uh, as he has a great future, a great, uh, uh, a wonderful plan for each life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege it is now ours to now dedicate these little ones to you. We acknowledge, Father, that you have blessed each of these families with these beautiful young lives. I pray, Father, you'll go before them and guide them, that you will guard them and provide for them. And Lord, I pray that these little ones will come to a place in life where they will partner with you and that they will see you have a plan for their life. Bless the families and friends who are here to celebrate. I pray this will be a significant, monumental, and wonderful day. I pray it'll be a day they long recall with, with fondness and with blessedness. 
Thank you for a church that we can set aside this time to dedicate these to you. We lift them to you with great gratitude. Father, we say thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Don't these young families do beautiful work? Let's give them a good hand. God bless you guys. Bye, y'all. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see.
Heavenly Father, we just come to you today and God, we just wanna lift you up in praise. God, that you are holy, that you are worthy. And God, we know with just the mention of your name, chains can be broken, shackles can be loosed. So God, I pray right now, as we say the name of Jesus, Lord, that we are able to lay down those burdens, the things that we brought in here today. God, whatever is holding us captive, Lord, that we're able to let those go right now. God, we just speak your name, Jesus, over all of those, over our struggles, over our anger, over our guilt, over our unforgiveness, God, whatever it is, we just speak your name over that. God, we ask that you begin to heal us, that we can let those things go. God, your son came and paid a price so that we didn't have to carry it. So God, loosen the chains today. God, we thank you that we can come to a place and lift up your name, God, and just spend time in your presence. So God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just fall in this place. God, that you would invade the homes of everybody that's here. God, bless them. Show them your love, show them your strength, show them your power. God, show them your mercy today. God, I pray over Pastor Bill, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just be on him. God, that whatever comes out of his mouth will just pierce our hearts, will draw us just a little bit closer to you, God. God, I pray for the offering. Lord, there's so many people out there that need you. And I pray that our efforts will be able to change lives. God, that people will come here to know you. God, thank you for all you do. We love you, we praise you, we glorify you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can go ahead and be seated. The ushers will be coming in just a moment, but first let's see what is happening here at the Met. Hi, my name is Amber and this is your Met 5. Fall has finally arrived, which means MetFest is right around the corner. MetFest is our annual festival, celebrating all of the amazing things that God has done in our church and the community. We'll have live music, food trucks, bounce houses, a hayride, and trick-or-treat. Each of our trucks is sponsored by the Life Groups right here at the Met, so it's a great opportunity for you to connect with them and figure out what our Life Groups are all about. This event is our way of saying thank you and to give you an opportunity to have fun with all of your friends and family. So bring your long chairs and mark your calendars for Sunday, October 27th from 1 to 4 p.m. Speaking of MetFest, we just added the opportunity for you to get baptized. Yes, you heard that right. If you've been thinking about taking that next step of faith and want the opportunity to take it outside surrounded by all of the festivities, we'll have a team of staff members ready to welcome and celebrate it right alongside of you. Are you interested in that? If so, then send us a message on Facebook or Instagram or email Pastor Jordan at jday at metchurch.com. Ladies, join us for Authentic on November 15th from 6 to 10 p.m. Authentic is a special night filled with laughter, learning, and inspiration that will renew your soul. This event is designed for mature teens and women to connect with other ladies here at the Met, connect with your true self, and connect with God. There will be an expo, a fall fashion show, hors d'oeuvres, giveaways, worship, and a special prayer time. Speakers Lainey Butler and Jesse Beebe will remind us of the amazing daughters that God has created each of us to be. Have you recently made a decision to trust Christ, still questioning that decision, or ready to be baptized as your next step of faith? Then our Faith and Baptism class is just for you. This class is for all adults and is the perfect opportunity for you to meet some of our staff and let us help you grow in your faith. Our next class will be held on Sunday, October 27th from 11 to noon in Classroom C. The holidays are coming up and we know that the loss of our loved ones affects us every day that they're not with us. Oftentimes, the holidays can be especially tough. We want to stand alongside you by offering a seminar as part of our Grief Share class called Surviving the Holidays. This seminar will be held on Sunday, November 3rd at 5.30. Through this, we'll hear stories and testimonies of what others are doing to move forward in their lives and learn how we can find hope together during this holiday season. For all the details on any of the events listed, visit metchurch.com slash met5. Here you'll find information and links to register. And of course, you can always visit the information counter in the lobby. 
Thanks for watching. I'm Amber, and this was your Met 5. Of the darkest year, the one you learn that life can go and disappear. And the holy light is a gathering here. Cause how can he explain the kind of pain you feel? I just want to hold you, I don't really know if I can fix this deal. Hate to see you hurting, now you're not a burden, I volunteer. I'll drown in the river, I'll swim out to you I'll stand and deliver, I'll carry through If you lose all the meaning of life, love and truth I'll stand and deliver, I'll show up for you It comes to pass, don't come to stay Heal these wounds when you had a very bad day As long as we are living, the desert is our lie We'll hold on to each other in the darkness and the light Wolves round in the river, I'll swim out to you I'll stand and deliver, I'll carry through If you lose all the meaning of life I'll show up for you I'll stand, stand and deliver yeah. I'll stand, stand and deliver I'll stand, stand and deliver I'll stand, stand and deliver yeah. Even though we've been low down Got someone to give you a head up All I need is a lifetime to prove this will be the last one here. Are you married to me? You're fired. Go. Well, the series we're in is designed to help us navigate, uh, to adapt and to adjust to some of the changes that we're going through in our lives. 
Everybody in this room is probably going through some kind of a season. Some of you might be in a season of great blessing. Some of you might be going through a season of great testing. Uh, but we all go through seasons. As we said last week, the great thing about a season is they end. <laughs> they don't last forever. Now, cycles are different. Cycles tend to repeat. So when you go through something, you have to ask again, is this a season or a cycle? If it's a season, it'll end. If it's a cycle, you have to end it. And so this morning, as we go through the difficult seasons of life, we find that there are things that God teaches us. There are things that we can learn. Now, we use different metaphors to describe different difficult seasons. One of the ways we'll describe a hard season is we may say it's a dark season. I'm going through a difficult season. This is a very uh, depressing, distressing season on my life or my family. And the metaphor I want you to think about a little bit with me this morning is the idea of a, of a dark season, going through those difficult experiences of life and what we can learn from those experiences and what God may be trying to, to teach us. I'm convinced this morning, it's no accident you're here. I believe that the providence of God brought you here for a reason. I think he has something for you to hear. I think he has something for you to know. And so my prayer is that you'll be open and receptive to whatever his spirit would ask uh, to speak into your life today. Because I don't need help when I'm going through a good season. I need help when I'm going through a difficult season. And so this morning, we're going to talk about those difficult seasons. And I can tell you, as last week we said, uh, part of discovering the new normal is you find a new life, you adjust to the new life. But this morning, I want to tell you that a part of finding the new normal is you find a new light that in the darkness, in the dark, depressing seasons of life, God can show you new light. Now, the thing about darkness that I have to just say up front is darkness is really not a thing. <laughs> darkness is not a thing. Darkness is the absence of a thing. You don't go into a room and turn on the dark. You go into the room and turn on the light. Uh, light is invincible against the darkness. You can't measure darkness. You can measure light. We can say there's so much wattage we can say something travels at the speed of light, but nothing travels at the speed of dark. So darkness, if by definition is the absence of a thing, then it stands to reason one of the seasons that we enter, to, uh, enter into is brought upon us by the absence of a thing. Maybe the absence of a dream. Maybe the absence of a job. Maybe the absence of, uh, you know, of, of, of a sale that you had really worked hard to land and to secure and to, and to close and it went away. And all of a sudden you find yourself kind of a little depressed, kind of morose. You're in just this little dark place and you realize really the reason I'm here and I've entered this season is the absence of a thing. Sometimes it's the absence of a person, not a something, but a someone and someone leaves your life or someone is taken out of your life, all of a sudden, it is the absence of someone that takes you into a, a dark place. So when you try to analyze and evaluate what you're going through this morning, if you're going through a difficult season, and once you do that, you try to identify, is it because of something that has been taken or someone that has been taken, then it allows you to kind of uh, begin to connect some dots. And I got, got good news for you this morning, and I can tell you that God does some of his greatest work in the dark seasons. Some of his greatest work in the dark seasons. In, fi in fact, I can show you that when Jesus was on the cross and he was perfecting redemption for us on the cross, uh, it was in the silence of the cross that salvation was completed. You remember when Jesus cries out as it became as, as dark as midnight at noonday and Jesus cries out through the darkness of the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, the reason God, who was a holy and just God, God could not look upon sin and there at that moment on the cross, Jesus had so completely become sin for us. He had taken on the sins of the world, past, present, and future, and because he had become so completely uh, carrying the burden of sin there at the cross, a holy and righteous God could not look upon sin, so he turns his back in the darkness of the cross. So it's in the silence of the cross that salvation was completed. Can I tell you, sometimes in the, when God appears silent in your life, he's doing some of his deepest work. Have you ever prayed and you felt like your prayers weren't, get, weren't getting above the ceiling fan? <laughs> just having some kind of weird inner monologue with you? You just prayed and you're waiting to hear something and you get nothing? And so you go, well, there you go. I just fired another one off toward heaven. I hope that hit something. I ain't gonna get nothing out of that one. 
I mean, I think at some point or another, you and I have all felt that way. We, we've all wondered about that sort of thing. And I'm just saying, when you feel silent and you feel God has gone silent, sometimes it's an indication he may be doing some of his most significant work in your life. Sometimes he does the most significant work in those dark experiences. Some of you may remember, and if you're young, you can Google this, it's really a real thing, when you had to take your photographs to a little store and have them develop for you. Remember those days? You, you took a little thing called film out of the camera and you took that thing called film and they'd put it in a little package and they'd send it away and maybe a year or two later you'd get them back. <laughs> and you had those little Instamatic cameras and all those kind of things, a little cube on top and you got four shots and you changed the cube. Holy cow, how old am I? Am I like 120 up here? <laughs> you guys are leaving me hanging like, who is this guy? The point is uh, that film was then sent away to a place where it was developed and it was developed in a place they called a dark room, right? And what they would do in the dark room is they would limit the exposure of the film to light while it was being developed. Too much light too soon and the image is ruined. Just enough light in the dark room and the image is perfected. And I'm saying some of you are in a dark room. <laughs> Some of you are in a dark place and it's because God may be developing something in and through you he cannot develop in any other area or any other place. The Bible opens in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then it says the earth was out without form and void and then it says and darkness was on the face of the deep. And then it said the spirit of God moved. Did you know God moves in the darkness? These little babies. All these little babies we dedicated, so precious, so wonderful. But did you know God develops those little ones in the darkness of that womb? When you go out and you plant anything in your garden or you plant anything uh, in your flower beds, you find that when you plant the seed and you cover it, it is in the darkness of the earth that that little seed begins to develop. What's my point? My point is I don't want you to miss this. That when you go through a dark season of life, don't think God is not up to something. He, he's doing something significant. Never misunderstand his silence for inactivity. Never misunderstand the darkness for God being apathetic. Sometimes he does his best work when he's quiet and when we're in the dark. In fact, if you have a Bible, look with me in Isaiah 45. I want to show you just a couple of verses and we'll go home. In Isaiah 45, look at this verse, verse three, it's real interesting. He says in Isaiah 45, three, I will give you, note this phrase, the treasures of darkness. Do you know there's treasure in darkness? God says, I have something I will put into your life that is valuable, something that is a treasure that you won't get anything anywhere else and you won't get it by any other means other than by darkness. And hidden riches of secret places. Why does he do that? that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by name and the God of Israel. God said, I'm gonna show off to you. I'm gonna prove myself to you. I'm gonna give you something in the dark experiences of your life you won't get anywhere else. I'm gonna do something in your life when you go through those dark seasons of life that you would not have uh, by any other means. In fact, he's saying, I have treasure for you. These are the treasures of darkness. Now continue to track. Go down to Isaiah 50. Let me give you a couple of more verses and we'll connect these. Isaiah 50, verse 10. Isaiah asks a rhetorical question. Who among you fears the Lord? Now he doesn't mean fear in the sense of cringing dread, right? When he says fear, he doesn't mean fear in the sense God will squash you like a bug in the rug. You know, like, oh God, I'm a, oh yeah. He doesn't mean, he means reverence. Who among you has a reverential fear of God. I respect his power. I respect his authority. I know what he's capable of doing. I know what he's done. That's the idea. And so Isaiah's asking a rhetorical question, and I could ask you the same. Who of, among us has reverence, reverential fear for the Lord? And I promise you probably the majority, if not everyone in this room would say that'd be me. I do. I have a great respect. I have a great reverence for God. You wouldn't be in this room this morning if you didn't. So Isaiah is finding his audience. All right, who among you has uh, this fear, reverence of the Lord? And then he asks the second question, who obeys the voice of his servant? Now, the two different questions, because he's talking to two different groups. He kind of thins the herd a little bit. A lot of people who have respect for God don't necessarily obey him. There's a lot of people who believe there's a God, but don't necessarily follow him. 
So he's finding his audience. He's saying, okay, I'm looking for people who have respect for God, who obey him. They're trying their best to walk in obedience, to do everything they know to do the right way. Take care of my family, love my kids, provide for them. I'm trying, God, I'm trying to connect the dots. I am trying to do everything I absolutely know I should do to live a good life, to be the person you've created me to be. Now, if that's you, this is for you. He says, you fear the Lord, you respect him, you obey his voice. Now note the next phrase, it doesn't even look like it ought to be in the context. Who walks in darkness and has no light. What? How can you respect God, obey him, and walk in darkness? Is it just me or does that look odd there? I mean, doesn't it almost look like it ought to say, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You'll never have a problem in your life because you fear God and you walk in his ways. But that's not what it says. It says that you can fear God, you can respect God, you can obey God, you can love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You can do everything right and go into a dark season without light. Doesn't mean God's upset at you. Doesn't mean God's mad at you. Doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It means sometimes the darkness develops some things in your life that won't get developed anywhere else. And then he concludes that narrative with this warning. He just says, just be careful. Don't try to kindle a fire on your own. Sometimes we get frustrated because these things take time. These things take time. You didn't get hurt overnight. You're not going to get healed overnight, probably. These things take time. And what happens when you're in a dark season is you want to get out of it so bad that you try to light your own fire. That's what he's saying. I'll get myself out here one way or the other. I had a friend say, you need to do something even if it's wrong. (laughs) Can I say that's the stupidest advice anybody ever gave another human being? (laughs) How is it doing anything wrong can end up working out for right. It just doesn't work that way. The Bible says in Isaiah, therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious to you. W- waiting time isn't wasted time. Sometimes you just need to chill, resign yourself from being the chairman of the universe and realize there's a whole lot in your life you ain't in control of. Now, I think you need to fix what you can fix and control what you can control. But when you go into a season like this, what you discover is I have outpunted my coverage. I'm in a situation, I didn't necessarily get myself into this. Light has been withdrawn, someone, something. I'm in a dark season and I gotta be careful that I don't, come on baby, light your fire right now. And he's just saying, don't light your fire. He said, if you try to get yourself out of this without my help, here's what, read this now, you will encircle yourself with sparks thinking that's the, what, what I need to do. I'm gonna walk in the light of my own fire in the sparks I've kindled. God says, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna lie down in sorrow, out of the firing pan, into the fire. You're gonna make it worse. Some things you cannot fix. Some people you can't fix. And I'm just saying, when you go into a dark season, you're going to have to resign yourself to God's purpose and his plan for your life because understand he's doing something in this season of your life and there's certain things you can absolutely do. This text spells them out and I'll give them to you. And when you're able to do these things, here's what I found. I'll tell you from personal experience, it is possible to see in the dark. It's possible to see in the dark. Number one, here's what he said. First thing, look to God. Look at verse 10, trust in the name of the Lord. You know what Isaiah's saying? He's saying, where's your focus? Are you problem conscious or God conscious? Remember that famous story of David facing Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, and he had such amazing courage for a kid? All of the warriors hiding in the rocks, and David stands alone before the giant, and everybody's saying, how in the world does this kid get that kind of faith and that kind of strength? And when you look at it and you really study it, what you find is everyone else was seeing how much bigger the giant was than they were. And David looked at it a different way. He said, I'm looking at how much bigger God is than the giant is. It's perspective. When you're in a dark season, you need to realize you have an awesome God. 
You have a God who stepped from nowhere and stood on nothing and spoke everything into existence and it stays there because he tells it to. Nothing's too hard for him. You didn't bring a problem in here he can't handle. He never heard you pray and scratch his head and say, I have to get back with you on that. You are far more messed up than I ever imagined. <laughs> never happened. I'm just saying, man, when you're going through something, you're not the only one that's ever been down that road. He's handled this before. He's heard it all. Your prayers won't shock him. And I'm just saying, man, when you're in a dark place, Isaiah said, let me counsel you. When you're in a dark place, look to him. Focus on him. Get your eyes on him. And sometimes that takes a lot of, a, a lot of faith. I told you when I came back that first weekend after Cindy had gone to heaven and how hard that was navigating through and still that season. And I told you the thing that I had to rely on to, to, to survive was my faith. And can I tell you sometimes when you're in a dark place, your eyesight will not give you perspective because it's too dark to see. You know what you rely on? Insight. Insight. That's where your faith is. When your eyesight doesn't work, your insight always works. When Paul prayed on one occasion, he said, I pray that the, listen, the eyes of their heart might be enlightened. Did you know you have eyes in your heart? <laughs> you have an ability to see from your heart. You have instinct. You have insight. And when your eyesight fails you in a dark place, your insight will never fail because your insight is based on faith. Faith to stand, faith to withstand. When the writer of Hebrews was talking about faith in Hebrews 11, he said, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. It's the substance of things not yet seen. Well, what is faith? Evidence. What is faith? Substance. What is the evidence of my faith? I can talk to my friends and see what they've gone through and find out the secret of their survival. Was their faith? Evidence. I can look into the Bible and I read stories of people who have gone through an incredibly th incredible hard things and I find that they survive. Well, what's its evidence? What is substance? Well, break the word apart. What does substance mean? Substance. Sub means to go beneath. You have a submarine beneath the surface of the ocean. Sub means beneath. Stance is to stand. Faith is substance. Faith is something that goes beneath me upon which I stand. So when I have faith, I'm standing on something. It's not just, faith is not wishing something to be so, so hard that it suddenly becomes so. Faith is based on something. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 13, five, he has said, God said, I will never leave you or forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, whom shall I fear? Put those two verses together. He has said, so that we may say. What is faith? Faith is when I say what he said. I'm not making this up, I'm saying what he said. God said, I'll never leave you in that verse. I'll never forsake you. It's two things. To leave means I'll never remove my presence from you. Forsake means I'll never emotionally disconnect from you. You can be emotionally disconnected to someone you are physically connected to. And you can be physically disconnected from someone that you are very emotionally connected to. And God is saying concerning your human experience, let me say I will never remove my presence from you and I will never emotionally disconnect from you. He said, so that I can say. So when you go through those dark hours and you feel like no one understands and no one gets it, say what he said. And let faith be the substance. Let it be the thing upon which you stand. What am I saying? I'm saying look to God. Number two, what's the next thing he said? He said, lean on God. Notice that, next, that verse he says in verse 10, and rely, rely upon his God. Some translations have it, and stay upon his God. The word rely, the word stay, the root word for that word is the word staff, staff. <clears throat> what a shepherd would carry. And one of the values of the staff, and there were many, but one of the values of the shepherd's staff is that when the shepherd was going through a storm or in a dark place, he would use the staff to steady himself. He would lean oftentimes on the staff to rest himself. And Isaiah is using that imagery because he knew the people of his day would certainly get it. He said, man, when you're in a dark place, you can see in the dark if you look to the Lord. 
You can see if you'll use your insight when your eyesight has failed you and not only look to God, but lean on him. Lean on him. You know what the value of leaning on him, and there's so many things I could share, but I just, for time's sake, would tell you one of the greatest values of leaning on God is you're leaning on someone who will not fail you. He loves you more than you love you. You might not die for you, but he did. And can I tell you this morning, it may be hard for you to understand, but listen, God only wants for you the things that you would want for you if you just knew what he knows. He loves you that much. He's a friend. The Proverbs 17 said that'll stick closer than a brother. He's the one that will come into your life if everybody else has walked out. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. In the darkest seasons of life, he's there. Third thought. Finally, Isaiah said, leave it with God. Leave it with him. Don't get frustrated and don't get impatient and don't run out of here and try to light your own fire. Leave it with him. Wait on him. Be sensitive to him. Sometimes we can get answers and we, though we have the answers and we start connecting the dots, we get frustrated because we want our prayers answered and we want them answered right now. We know what we want, we know what we need, or we think we do, and so we make these demands of God when he's working off timing as we're working off time. God is a God of rhythm. You and I, we look at the clock, we look at the calendar, and he looks at rhythm. He, he's not going to do anything until it's time, and the fullness of time he sent forth his son. So God may not be saying no to you right now, he may be saying not now to you right now. <laughs> it's not time. He didn't want you to go up like a rocket and come down like a rock. He's waiting until the right time and the timing in your life. And I'm just saying, in the midst of this, when you haven't seen it happen yet, you're, you're in the meantime, you know what we call an intermediate period? You know what we call an intermediate immediate period, <laughs> a meantime? We say we're in the, in the meantime. The meantime is somewhere between where I am and where I want to be. It's the meantime. You know what we call It's mean times. Would you agree with that? <laughs> They're mean times. When you're in the meantime, it's a mean time, baby. It's hard time. And I'm just saying, when you're in the meantime, when you're where you are and where you hope you can be and where you're praying you will be in the meantime, don't light your own fire. Wait on God. I had a guy, I was talking about not losing your patience one weekend and, you know, anger, and I kind of did a little funny. I thought it was funny. A few people have called on about road rage. And, uh, and so I was telling him, I said, look, if you, have, if you are a road rager, would you do me one little favor, please? Please, peel that Met Church bumper sticker off your car <laughs> if you are given to road rage, right? And in its place, put a Fellowship Church or a Gateway sticker, right, on that. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. I'm not. I love those guys. Don't get me wrong. I know Ed, Robert, we're friends. I'm just saying. And I did that weekend one time. I was talking about road raging. And the guy came up the next weekend. He goes, man, that was me, Bill. He said, my wife, I looked over at her when you were talking about that. I said, man, I got to get that under control. I'm just wrong, man, I gotta deal with that. And he says, man, I really felt like I had victory over that. I felt like, man, that's it, I finally got what I needed. And, yeah. and he said, man, Bill, he said, I left the church and I'm heading over here on I-35 and some idiot would not let me on the freeway. <laughs> and I thought, well, you had the answer from the church to the freeway. You, you, you had it for a mile, that's not bad, baby steps. Baby steps. What's the point? The point is you can hear everything I'm saying and say, well, it's biblical, it's right, I agree with everything he's saying. Walk out of this room and get frustrated and light your own fire. And God said you're gonna make it worse. Some things you can't fix. Some people you can't fix. So what do you do? Turn them over to the Lord. You take care of you. Here's what I found about my life. I found the biggest secret to an effective life is take care of not your five-year plan, take care of your five-minute plan. You make good calls in the next five minutes of your life and your five-year plan tends to take care of itself. Make good decisions in the next five minutes. Leave it with God. He can be trusted. Just leave it with him. Let me give you this and we'll go home. My adopted pastor who's in heaven today Adrian Rogers told a story of a young family who had suffered an unimaginable loss. This man's wife had died, leaving a beautiful little daughter without her mother. 
He said one of the hardest things that that dad and daughter did was to go back to that house for the first time without her presence. I know what that's like. Some of you do too. He said, when it came time to go to bed, the little girl asked, she said, Dad, is it okay if I sleep with you? It's so dark. He said, sweetheart, you can sleep with Dad. He said he tucked her in. He kissed her. He went around to his side of the bed, and he laid down. And the little girl said to him, Dad, is your face turned toward me? The dad said, honey, I'm looking right at you. She said, I can't see you. He said, that's okay, I'm here. And I can see you even in the dark. Without assurance, that little girl went to sleep. And that man thought about what his daughter asked him and he thought about what he said to her. And he got out of the bed and got on his knees. And he said, God, is your face toward me? God, can you see me in the dark? And after a brief period of time with that assurance, he crawled in bed and went to sleep. You may be in a dark place this morning. I can relate to that. What I'm finding is you can see in the dark. It's a new normal. It's a skill I didn't have before. But you can see in the dark. Keep looking to him. Keep leaning on him. Keep leaving it with him. He cannot fail. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your presence. I pray for my friends here in this room this morning and those watching who may never have trusted you as Savior. Give them the courage to say, Lord Jesus, with all that I know about me, I trust all that I know about you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. I can't do this on my own. For others here this morning, Lord, who are in a dark season, I pray you'll bring them joy. You said weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Bring them joy. May they feel it even now to know this season will end. They'll laugh again. They'll have joy again. They'll see a plan and a purpose. For some who need someone to pray for them before they go, I pray as soon as I dismiss, they'll find their way here to the front. Let someone spend a few moments just to pray for them and encourage them before they leave. Thank you, Father, for the hope we have. Thank you, Lord, for the partnership with you and the fellowship with you. I pray you'll bless us as we enter a brand new week. And Lord, help us to learn to see in the dark. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time.